All right, good afternoon. Uh, today's topic, machine learning, uh, sorry, deep learning. All topics are machine learning. Um, I'll dive right in, we have a lot to discuss today. This is where we left off last week, before the break. We discussed, um, we discussed, yeah, we discussed neural networks. Before the break, after the break, we discussed support vector machines. Forget about that. This is where we left off. This is a neural network. Uh, the little circles represent numbers, and the uh, uh, arrows represent weights we apply to those numbers. And by uh, feeding data into the bottom of the network and feeding it forward, we end up with a value at the end. I'll do a very brief recap of... Uh, the uh, main things we, the, the most important thing we talked about, which is the backpropagation algorithm. Uh, just going through the, the slides, basically the idea of backpropagation is that um, if we have a very complex function, we cannot easily or cheaply work out the derivative by hand. We need the computer to do it for us, first of all. And second of all, we cannot do it purely symbolically. We need a mixture of symbolic and numeric operations. And that mixture is called backpropagation. That looks like this. So here's an example function. First step is to, uh, we do, I mean, basically, if you're good at taking derivatives, you can work this one out. But I'll, we'll use a simple example just to uh, make it easy. The first step is to break it up into subfunctions, steps that we apply. So basically, this function f consists of applying these steps a, b, c, and d in order. So f can be rewritten as the composition of all these functions. So far, so straightforward. Uh, which we can represent with what we call a computation graph, where the dots are values and the arrows between dots are operations on those values. Right? And because we've now rewritten our function as a um, sequence of composed uh, small, smaller functions, we can just apply the chain rule repeatedly which looks like this, to uh, rewrite the derivative of this function. So we start with f over x, which is what we're interested in, the derivative of f over x. And that splits apart step by step into this product of derivatives by applying the chain rule step by step by step. And we call this the global derivative. What we're interested in, the um, function, the overall function with respect to its parameters. And every one of these factors in the product we call a local derivative. And the way backpropagation works is at this point, we, um, so we uh, write our function as this composition of modules. We work out these local derivatives symbolically, as we've done before, just on pen and paper. And then we type them into the computer as a function. We do a forward pass. So we work the value x through all these modules. Uh, and we remember the intermediate value. So we remember the output of A, we remember the output of B, and so on and so on. And then we apply these intermediate values to the local derivatives numerically. So then we do numeric computation on the local derivatives. So here's what it looks like for this function. Uh, this is the chain rule applied to the derivative, as we saw. This is each local derivative at the bottom here, each local derivative worked out symbolically. Uh, so this, up to this point, we work it out symbolically. Then we do the forward pass, which gives us values for C, B, and A, which we can fill into this function and then compute it numerically. That's the back prop propagation algorithm. Here's an example. I'll rush through that. Um, So that's the basic backpropagation algorithm. And we'll call that scalar backpropagation because we're, uh, whenever we take the derivative, it's always the scalar derivative of one uh, number over another number. And we will contrast that in this lecture with uh, matrix or tensor backpropagation where we start taking derivative, uh, derivatives of vectors and matrices with respect to vectors and matrices. Uh, but we'll see how that works in this, later in this lecture. And then the message that we ended on, 
is that even though we draw it like this, and we call it a neural network, like it's some special uh, facsimile of the brain, practically what we're computing is actually a very simple linear algebra function. So what we do in the first layer is we take every input, multiply it with a unique weight for every output, and sum those, which is basically what you do when you multiply by a matrix. So this first step is just uh, over the uh, orange weights is just matrix multiplication. The addition of the bias nodes is just adding to the output H uh, three more values. So that's just like adding a vector, B, which gives us our uh, hidden layer before the activation. Then applying the activation function, the sigmoid function in this case, is just an element-wise operation on the vector. We've seen element-wise operations, hopefully, in the first homework uh, and in the worksheet. So this, just, uh, this is nonlinear, but it's just an element-wise operation, which gives us h, the values of the hidden layer. And then applying the hidden layer, again, is just an application of weights, uh, which is a matrix, but in this case, we have only one output weight, so it becomes a dot product, basically. And then there's just one bias value, which we add to give us our output of our network. So this is just to say, basically, neural networks are just big stacks of linear uh, algebra operations with little bits of nonlinearity in between. Which makes it easier to write. Because this is now how you can write a neural network, which makes things simpler. So it's simpler to write and to think about, but it's also faster to compute. Because matrix multiplication is a well-studied operation and we can do this very well in parallel. This is a uh, function that is easy to parallelize and for which we have good hardware available. So we basically, these GPUs that were normally just um, meant for playing computer games, it turns out that they're very, very good at quickly multiplying matrices. And since that's most of what a neural network does, uh, if we can offload this kind of computation to the GPU, things get a lot quicker. And that's one of the reasons why uh, deep learning took off in uh, the last uh, five to 10 years because GPUs became available and became very quick. So two reasons why it's nice to have this in matrix notation. It's easier for us to write and to analyze, and it's easier to compute. Which brings us to de deep learning. Basically, deep learning is what we already did with neural networks, but deeper and more flexible. Uh, and for that, you need a deep learning system, also known as an uh, automatic differentiation engine. We'll go into the details today of how those works, how those work. And I've used the basic operation of PyTorch, which is one of these systems, as a sort of guide for how to structure this, but most of these systems, PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, Cafe, they all work roughly the same. Uh, then in order to, uh, the, the main thing that this deep learning, these deep learning systems do, do is backpropagation, uh, but they do it on matrices and vectors and tensors. So in order to, fit, to uh, work out how that works, to describe how that works, uh, we need to revisit backpropagation and deal with a couple of things we didn't deal with in the previous lecture, which is why I just repeated the, that part of the previous lecture. That's enough uh, before the break. Then we'll talk about sort of the um, bag of tools you need to make deep neural networks work. Like I said, up until the 90s, we really only used these feed-forward neural networks practically, and we only made them two layers deep, because more than that didn't really work. And uh, around 20, somewhere between 2005 and 2010, that changed because we developed a number of tricks. And I'll go through the main tricks first thing after the break. And then one of the nice things about this uh, deep learning system is that you can do other things than fully connected layers. So what we've seen so far is just a, a fully connected feed-forward layer where every input node is connected to every output node. 
but actually deep uh, neural networks get really powerful when you don't do that, when you sort of uh, use your knowledge about the domain to figure out exactly how you're going to wire these input nodes and output nodes together. And the first example of that we'll see is the convolutional neural network or the convolutional layer. And then finally, hopefully, if there's time, zoom out a little bit and discuss what we really mean by deep learning and what makes it so special and what sets it apart from other methods of machine learning. So that's the plan for today. I should also say there is a lot of math in this lecture, a lot of big slides with, uh, slides with a lot of symbols. Um, the upshot of that is that after we've defined all this, after we have our deep learning system, we've hit kind of a new le level of abstraction. And a lot of what we want to do afterwards, we can just say, uh, we can leave a lot of the complexity to the deep learning system. Basically, we only have to describe the model and doing the backpropagation, working out the gradients after this lecture will be taken care of by the deep learning system. So after today, we'll be done with all the gradients. Occasionally, we'll work out a gradient just to help our intuition. But basically, after we've built all this and set, the, set all this up, uh, it saves us a lot of effort because then the computer can do it. So just to say it's worth it. Um, so the aim for the first part of this lecture and for uh, building our deep learning system, firstly, is to move from scalar backpropagation to tensor backpropagation. So we want to build functions not of numbers, but functions of tensors. I'll describe what tensors are later. Uh, we want to build functions with multiple inputs and outputs. And over any of these, uh, any way we, we chain these computations together, these computations over tensors, we want to be able to do backpropagation. Uh, and we want the system to uh, do the backpropagation for us. That's what we're uh, aiming for. So the main ingredient we need to define first is what's a tensor and what's a function over a tensor. What kind of functions are we going to describe? So let's start there, tensors. That's our basic unit, our basic data structure that we will operate on in all cases. Uh, tensors are what are called multidimensional arrays. So arrays of uh, an, uh, a given number of dimensions. So if you have a, a zero dimensional array, that's called a scalar or a number. That's not very special. A one dimensional array, we've also seen already that's called a vector because we have a bunch of numbers together and they vary in one direction. So if you, you can move in one direction to change the number, that's called a vector, and it has a shape expressed by one number, in this case three, which is the length, the number of numbers in the vector. A two tensor, uh, also shouldn't surprise you, is a matrix, because it's a bunch of numbers again, but we can change the uh, number by moving in one direction or the other direction. So it's a two-dimensional array and it has a shape expressed by two numbers, because it's a two tensor, <coughs> in this case, three by two. Uh, for matrices, it's good to remember that the um, vertical dimension comes first. So uh, rows first, then columns, three by two. Also with indexing, if you want to get flexible and, and uh, confident with linear algebra, that's one of the rules you have to really hammer into your head. All right, three tensor. And again, a bag of numbers, uh, and you can change the number by moving in three directions now. No na standard name for this. And it has a shape defined by three numbers. And it looks like this sort of Rubik's cube type thing if you draw it. Uh, so it's just a generalization of a matrix. Four tensor is more difficult to draw. <clears throat> Usually I do this sort of trick with uh, dots and arrows, but basically it's this kind of thing that we've seen already, except it changes in four dimensions. It's difficult to visualize, but the basic principle is the same. It just has four dimensions along which you can index it. It has a shape expressed by four numbers. Uh, and I usually draw it like this if I have to draw it. Um, so here your visual intuition will let you down, but if you work with these things a little bit, you'll soon get used to it. Uh, so this is what will this data structure, there are data structures for this, uh, we will use to describe everything in our model, from the weights to the data uh, to the loss to everything. So let's have a look at 
what different things look like when we represent them as tensors. First up, some basic classification data, which we've seen already. So this is the two-feature classification data set from the first lecture. If we were to express that as data, the most common way to do that would be to uh, separate the features in the class. Uh, the features are a matrix with uh, instances uh, vertically. And the uh, class is first translated to a number. Uh, so at this point, we assume that all features in all uh, classes are numerical. So if anything's categoric, we have to translate it to numerical data, either by one hot coding or by integer coding. Uh, see the um, fourth lecture for that, methodology two. Uh, so, and we, uh, so basically we have a matrix X for the data and a big vector that is as long as the matrix tall for the class labels. So that's sort of straightforward. Uh, but we can represent other data as well, for instance, images. Uh, most of you will know basically that an image consists of pixels, and every pixel has three numbers to describe it, which is how much red there is in it, how much green there is it, in it, and how much blue there is in it. Uh, so if we put the width on one dimension, the, uh, the width on one dimension, the height on one dimension, and these three channels on one other dimension, we get a three tensor, and a three tensor describes an image. So it's basically three matrices on top of each other, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. And you stack these on top of each other, you can print a color picture. Uh, so a single pixel, if you isolate it, becomes a vector like this, of, uh, of uh, length three. So that's how you represent an image in a tensor, an RGB image. And if you have a data set of image, images, just to show you that we can go beyond three tensors, it becomes a four tensor. So you add one more dimension, and that dimension indexes the list of images that you have. Uh, and that's what it looks like. If you do the Keras worksheet, you will see this. Here you load the CIFAR 10 data. If you do that and you ask for the shape, then uh, NumPy, it's a NumPy array, NumPy will give you this four-dimensional shape. So it's 50,000 images of 32 by 32 pixels with each pixel containing three color values. So it sounds mysterious, this four tensor, but it's basically just uh, this sort of thing. So that's how we use tensors. Now we need to define functions on those tensors. And we'll use lots of operators that we've already seen in NumPy. If you do the PyTorch num, uh, worksheet, you'll see lots of, diff uh, lots of new operators. We can slice and we can add and we can multiply and sum and all that. Um, basically, this is the constraints that we'll use, a function takes a bunch of inputs, uh, can be an arbitrary number, but all of them have to be tensors, and it produces a bunch of outputs. It can be an arbitrary number, but all of them have to be tensors. So that's a function in our system, uh, also called operations or ops, depending on what system you use. And functions need to implement two things they need to do already used the word function, but they need to do two things. They need to provide two, uh, that's called the methods then. So the forward is basically what you would normally provide if you implement a function in a programming language. You take the inputs, you do some computation on them, and you produce the outputs. That's just a basic function. But we also need the backward, something in the other direction, which is given the gradient over the output, produce the gradients over the inputs. We'll look at that in a lot more detail, but this is the basic structure. All, any, we can use any function we like, but all functions need to implement both of these things in order to be usable in our system, forward and backward. So now we, can, we have our basic ingredients, tensors and functions, and we can start chaining these together. We put some tensors into a function, we get some new tensors out, we put those into another function, and so on and so on. And one more thing that is new here uh, that we don't see in normal programming, whenever we do computations, we remember everything we've done. Because we're going to do this forward, backward thing of the backpropagation. So we need to remember every computation that we're doing. And we do that in something called a computation graph. We've seen that word already 
but here it is again. So let's say we have some uh, tensors A, B, and uh, from which we derive new tensor C. So here we have two tensors and two functions on them, multiplication and addition. So it's a very simple example. The computation graph for that computation looks like this. So we take these values, we multiply A and B together, which gives us a new value, which doesn't have a name up here, we call it X, and we add that to B, which gives us C. So it's very straightforward, but we have to remember all of this in order to be able to do the backpropagation. So as we compute, we make sure that we remember everything. And that's what an auto, uh, automatic differentiation engine or deep learning system does. It performs computations by chaining functions. It keeps track of all of these in a computation graph. And when the computation is finished, we walk backwards through the computation graph to perform the backpropagation. And the way of doing this that we will stick with is called eager evaluation, where we apply this uh, function to a bunch of tensors. We immediately evaluate the outcome, so we immediately execute the forward pass, and we remember the structure of the computation for later. So we do everything in one go, and that's called eager evaluation, and that's by far the most popular way of doing this. So let's look at an example. First, we make two tensors, and we stick some data in them. In this case, it's just scalar data, so just numbers, but this, these could be tensors of any size and any rank. Uh, and this is sort of pseudocode. This is not exactly how it works in PyTorch, sort of almost how it works in PyTorch. Uh, so this is sort of just pseudocode, something you might implement. Um, so we make this tensor object, tensor object A, tensor object B, and it has two fields. One is the data, which is the, just the numbers in this uh, multidimensional array. In this case, just one number. And it has a field gradient, which is left open. And after we're done with the computation graph, once we do the backpropagation, we're going to fill in all these grad fields. Uh, but for now, we'll leave them empty. So we do this in Python, uh, or in, in our, whatever our programming language. We multiply the two together. Normally, you just get your numeric answer, and it forgets about the, how it got there. But now, we, when we apply the multiplication operator, we create a new object which again is a tensor. It has some data, which we can fill in now because we can look at the data of A and look at the data of B, multiply them together and work out what the data of C is going to be. It has a gradient field, which we'll leave open for now. And it has a pointer backwards to where it came from, which is to say, we got here by applying the multiplication operator to tensor A and B. So we're remembering the computation graph. Now we have C. And then on C, we call backpropagation, backprop. And backprop is the function that walks backwards down this computation graph and fills in the gradient. In this case, first C has gradient 1, and B has gradient 1, and A has gradient 1. That's the basic operation of uh, automatic differentiation. And if we have a, a slightly more complicated example, like our feed-forward network, it looks like this, so this is what it looks like on paper. This is what it looks like in code. We uh, define tensors for our weights of our neural network in the top uh, line. We loop through our data, we assume the data is given. We compute the forward pass of our neural network. So the hidden layer is the sigmoid applied to w multiplied by x plus the bias uh, vector. And then we do the same thing again for the second layer, which gives us y. We compute the loss, which is the difference between the output of our neural network and the target given in the data. And then we backpropagate on the loss, because we want the derivative of the loss over the weights. That's what the, the gradient that we're interested in. And then we can do a gradient descent step. Once we have all these gradients, we can add them, or we can subtract them from the weights. And then we've updated the weights, and we keep doing that again and again and again. And that's how a neural network is trained in a modern deep learning system, which gives you a computation graph that looks a bit like this, which just about fits on the slide. So now we need to drill into this backpropagation. That's sort of the outer skeleton of how this deep learning system works. <coughs> 
uh, now we need to drill into this backpropagation. These are our constraints. Functions can have, as we said, any number of inputs and outputs. They have to be tensors, can be tensors of any rank. But there's one important constraint, which is that in order for any of this to work efficiently, the final output of our computation graph, which is the thing with respect to which we uh, take the derivative, has to be a scalar. Whatever we do, however complicated our neural network, we can do whatever we like, but at the end we have to get one single number and we want, the deriv we want to fi uh, find the derivative with respect to that number. Uh, question? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, the, in the previous slide, this, um, where is it, the gradient that I was talking about? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's easier to see here. So uh, we have the gradients here. Um, so the gradients for W, W are the weights of this first layer of our neural network. The gradients of that uh, weight matrix tell us in which direction to update the neural network. Because we're doing basic gradient descent, so we're working out for the loss the gradient, and this tells us how to update the values of this weight matrix in order to uh, reduce the loss, basically. Yes, uh, we're using the gradients to find update values for the weights. So it's basic gradient descent. The only thing is that our network is now so complex that we need to figure out how to let the computer work out the gradient for us. We can't do it ourselves anymore. Uh, so the final output has to be a scalar, which doesn't put any limitation on your model. The model can still output pictures, it can output language, it can output video. That's all fine. So long as over that output, you can compute a single scalar loss. Because remember, we're computing the loss. So the computation graph is not just the model, it's the model plus the loss function. And in order to, uh, in this setting, to apply backpropagation, we need to uh, work out two things that we haven't worked out yet for backpropagation, because we've only done scalar backpropagation so far. Uh, first, we need to deal with these multiple inputs and outputs. And second, we need to figure out how to do this over uh, matrices and vectors. So I'll start with the multiple inputs and outputs. If we have a computation graph like this, and we want to apply the chain rule, it's fairly straightforward. We want to, uh, say, compute the derivative of C over X, and we just apply the chain rule along this path. So the derivative of C over X is C over, D, C over A times A over X. And if we want the other path, we do it along that path. So C over Y is C over B times b over y, just application of the chain rule. And the fact that there is also another input and another path along the uh, computation graph doesn't really bother us, bother us because um, when we're taking the derivative with respect to y, uh, x is just, a, we just see x as a constant, so it doesn't really affect us. Uh, until we come across a situation like this, a diamond, where we have one value, x in this case, which affects the output along two different paths in the computation graph. And then we have a problem, because we go, if we go along one path, we see this, apply the computation, the chain rule along a, a, we get c over a times a over x, and if we go along the other path, we get c over b times b over x, so which one do we choose? How does the chain rule work here? Uh, well. Turns out the rule is very simple. This is called the multivariate chain rule. And basically, you take all of these derivatives and you just sum them. So in this case, the derivative of c over x is just the chain rule applied over the a path plus the chain rule applied over the b path. And this holds. So just to look at an example, if we fill in a very simple module, so let's say c is derived from a and b specifically by multiplication, and we, and we want the derivative of c over x, we just fill in the value of c, 
So we want the derivative of a times b over x. Then we can apply the multivariate chain rule. So that's the derivative of a b over a times a over x plus a b over b times b over x. So two ways of taking derivative, we just sum them together. Uh, we see on the left that uh, a cancels out because b is now a constant. So here we just cancel out the a's against each other. Here a is a constant, so the b's cancel out. So we get this, which in slightly new notation, you might not recognize it, but this is basically the product rule. This is the product rule of der taking derivatives. So we've now shown that the product rule derives from the multivariate gradient rule. Same holds for the quotient rule, the one you use for uh, uh, devising, uh, and for many others. So most of them derive uh, fairly straightforwardly from this multivariate chain rule. If you have more than one path, you just sum up all the paths. So here we have a through k. We just sum up every possible path from x to c and sum up all the derivatives. So that's the multivariate chain rule taken care of. Which leaves us 15 minutes for backpropagation with tensors. Should be doable. But let's take a breath first. So we know that our forward pass, the computation of our neural network from inputs to outputs, can be done efficiently and quickly if we write it down as a sequence of matrix operations. So here we have weight matrix W times uh, input vector x and so on. We can work out the whole uh, forward computation of the network as a composition of modules, as we did in the scalar backpropagation example. So the question is, can we do the same thing here? Is there a chain rule for matrices and vectors and so on that lets us do this? Express the derivative that we're interested in, the loss over the weights of the first layer, for instance, as these uh, product of these local derivatives. Does that exist? And then if so, what are these local derivatives? How do we work those out? How do we compute those? Uh, so for this, we need to figure out what it means to take the derivative of a function that outputs, uh, let's go here, the derivative of a function that outputs a vector over uh, a matrix, which is complicated and confusing. So my first um, piece of advice in these situations, if you deal with this kind of thing, is to um, remember that any function that outputs a matrix or does matrix multiplication is basically just a very complicated linear, a very big linear function over scalar values, or a bunch of uh, uh, linear functions. It's all numbers being summed up and multiplied together. This is, uh, these things are just efficient ways to write it down, but you can always write it out using the sum notation as basically numbers, big bags of numbers being multiplied and added together. Uh, and if you look at it like that, we can always go back to the level that we know, which is taking scalar derivatives, and work out what it means in matrix terms. So I'll start with a simple example. <clears throat> so we have a function uh, here, fa, which is a scalar function, so it outputs a single number, but it takes, an, takes a vector as an input. So I'll take the derivative of this function with respect to its argument first, which is the derivative well, of the function with respect to a vector. So step one is we reduce it to a scalar derivative. So instead of taking the derivative with respect to the whole vector, we just take the derivative with respect to one element of the vector. In this case, number three. And we look at what this uh, tells us. So we write out the whole dot product, which is just the sum of all these things multiplied together. We see that A3 only appears in one term, so the rest of the terms we ignore. And the A3s cancel out against each other, each other, so we end up with B3. So the derivative of this function with respect to the third number in the vector is the third number in the uh, B vector. Which means that if we 
do this for any other number, for one, two, and three, uh, we get the same thing. We, uh, this number is the same here. So we get a bunch of different derivatives. And we can stick those into a vector. And that gives us a vector of derivatives that has the same shape as the thing we were taking the derivative over. So it makes a lot of sense to give that the same shape. So that it makes a lot of sense to, for the uh, derivative of a scalar function over a vector, for the result of that to be a vector of derivatives, like we see here. Uh, and in this case, it's just the, uh, the B vector. And that's basically what we've been calling the gradient all along. So this is fairly straightforward. And this principle we can apply, or we can apply whenever we are faced with a, a complicated derivative of one tensor over another. Uh, so let's look at what happens if the part above the division line is a vector. So we do a matrix multiplication. We have some function, we have some matrix B, and we multiply the vector A, which is the argument, by B. So the output of this is now also a vector. So we're looking for the derivative of a vector over a vector argument. And here we see it. Uh, matrix multiplication expressed as a diagram. So the red vector is A, the green matrix B. And the output is the gray vector. So again, we don't know what to do, so we reduce it to scalar, uh, a scalar derivative. We take some element of the uh, part above the line and some element of the part below the line. In this case, the second element of the gray vector, the output vector, which is B times A, and the third element of the argument vector over the third element of the argument vector. So these two numbers. We're taking the derivative of the orange part with respect to the uh, blue part. So the uh, second element of this uh, gray part is just the dot product of the second row of the matrix with the input, with the input uh, vector. So we'll write that like this a second. There's not really a good notation, standard notation for the rows of a matrix, but I'll just use a dot to represent that. So we have the second row. Multiply that by A. And we take the derivative over, the, um, over A3. Dot product we know how to express as a sum. We just sum over these three elements multiplied by these three elements. So it's the sum of three terms. This is the dot product. And we see that in only one term does A3 appear. So these two first two terms we can remove. A3 cancels out against A3, and only B23 is left. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we take the derivative of the second element of the output with respect to the third element uh, of the input, the result is the uh, 2, 3 index of the matrix. So if we write out all the possible derivatives that we can take, all elements of the input versus all elements of the output, we get another matrix. We can arrange that most naturally in a matrix. And that matrix turns out to be equal to B. Because for every element of the input, for every element of the output, we get these two indices, and those happen to correspond to basically the indices of B. So a very natural way to think of the matrix derivative, the derivative of this output vector over this input vector, is as a matrix, and that matrix happens in this case to be equal to B. So you notice that basically these uh, multiplications are very, the multiplication derivative is very analogous to the scalar val uh, function. So what we see here is that if we have a scalar derivative, uh, which is just some constant multiplied by the thing we're interested in, then we end up with just that constant, right? That's what happens here when we take the derivative over this term. And that's also sort of what happens in the whole function. We have the, our function is some constant matrix multiplied by our argument vector, which we're interested in. We take the derivative with respect to that argument. And because it's a simple multiplication, the arguments cancel out and we are left just with the constant. So that again makes a lot of sense. So when faced with matrix calculus, we start with the scalar derivative. We just pick one output over one input, number, 
and then we see to turn it into a tensor derivative, we see how we can most logically arrange it. And we look at all possible inputs and all possible outputs, which gives us a very natural tensor shape. Uh, and we arrange that, and that's our matrix derivative. So how do we arrange that? How do we make that more strict? What are the, the exact rules for how to arrange this? Well, it depends. If your input is a scalar and your output is a scalar, then obviously the result is a scalar. It's a scalar derivative that we've already seen. Uh, if your input is a vector, your output is a vector, then arranging all inputs versus all outputs give you very, gives you very naturally a matrix. If your uh, input is a scalar and your output is a matrix, you can map all inputs and outputs together. That gives you a matrix. But the main thing you see here is that once you get beyond this diagonal, so if you have a matrix with a vector or a vector with a matrix, then every input with every output is a three tensor, which I've put a question mark. Because at that point, it's really very difficult to um, deal with how to multiply these things. Basically, ma matrix multiplication is well-defined. Vector by matrix multiplication is well-defined. Up to this line, everything is well-defined. But below this line, if you want to multiply things, it gets very hairy and very difficult. So we don't really want to go below this line, which is a problem. Because if we go back to our chain rule, we now have ways of dealing with these local derivatives. But what we see here on the far right, k over w, is that even if we have a simple feed-forward network, uh, we already have a vector over a matrix. So the result is a three tensor, which we would need to multiply somehow with h over k, which is a matrix. So we have to multiply a three tensor with a matrix, which is not well defined and doesn't really work. So the way we did it in Scalar backpropagation, where we worked out all these factors in this product in isolation, won't work for us. We need to do something a little bit more clever, uh, which is to accumulate the gradient product from the loss down the network, which is why it's called backpropagation. We start with the loss and we go down the computation graph. Let's say we have just a chain of computations here to make things easy. We start with the loss. We're going to work work out this product from the loss and collapse it, multiply these things one by one. So the forward is the same given the inputs, compute the outputs. But the backward is not compute the local derivative. The backward is given the loss over the, given the uh, derivative, the gradients over the output with respect to the loss, compute the gradients over the input of the loss with respect to the input. But do this at the bottom here in such a way that we don't have to compute this y over x in isolation. So if we do this y over x in isolation, then we end up with this uh, three tensor that we can multiply. So all we need to do in order to work out what our backward function is, is take this multiplication, loss over y times y over x, work out what that is in simple terms, and implement that in simple terms rather than explicitly as a product of these two, two tensors. And we'll stick with the following convention that the gradient of A has the same shape of A. So we have the gradient here of loss over Y. Uh, we'll say that that has the same shape of sh same shape as Y and the gradient of the, so the loss over X also has the same shape as X. That's not always held that convention. Often, if you do the gradient, it's the transpose of the thing you're... Uh, the gradient over x would be the transpose of x. Uh, for instance, if you take a gradient vector, it's usually a, a row vector when the original vector is a column vector. In our case, we don't do this because we don't use the gradients as operators. We don't multiply by the gradients. We just want to uh, subtract the gradient from the value we already have. So we have some weights. We compute the uh, gradient over the weights, we want to subtract that from the weights, multiplied by a learning rate. Uh, and that's easiest done if these things always have the same shape. 
So we'll take that as a convention. So that helps us uh, to figure out what the arrangement should be. So now if we have our um, module here on the right, the module that we're interested in, this uh, thing that uh, takes, uh, sorry, function I should call it, the function that takes w and computes k. The forward is like this, just wx plus b. The arguments are wx and b. It has one output k. And then the uh, automatic differentiation system will give us the loss, uh, the derivative of the loss over k as a vector. k is a vector, so the gradient of k is also a vector, which will have been worked out because the backpropagation does, the, does all the steps for us, calls all the other modules. So once the backpropagation gets to us, gets to this module, we know the loss over k, uh, the gradient over k, which is a vector, and we need to figure out these three values to get the loss over the gradient over w, the gradient over x, and the gradient over b. Practically, we're only interested in the weight, so we're not usually interested in the gradient over x. But for our system, it just works out all the gradients over all the inputs, unless we tell it not to specifically. So look at one example. Uh, which is this k over w. That should say scalar derivative instead of scale derivative. It's keynotes, aggressive autocomplete. Um, so step one, as usual, when we're faced with something complicated in terms of matrix matrices, we first work out the scalar derivative. So instead of working out the derivative with respect to w, we pick one element of w, two, three in this case, and we see what the derivative look like, looks like with respect to that. That doesn't quite give us a scalar derivative yet, because we still have this vector k in the middle. But luckily, we've already seen how to deal with that. We've already seen a tool that helps us deal with that, which is the multivariate chain rule. So whatever happens here, whatever we do to this k, uh, its a collection of paths through a computation graph. In this case, relatively simple, but we don't really care. Um, so we can just take the derivatives, apply the chain rule over all of these uh, elements of k, and sum all those derivatives. So whatever this is in, in complicated matrix calculus terms, we can just replace it by the multivariate chain rule over all the elements of k. So it's the sum over all these derivatives, just applying the multivariate chain rule. And now it's the sum of scalar derivatives. So now we're back in our comfort zone. We know how to deal with this. These are scalar derivatives, so these we can just work out. So we just fill in what k i is. So it's the ith element of our multiplication. So this yields some vector, which has an ith element. That's a, uh, k i. We just fill that in. Uh, remember, l over k i is given by the system. We already know that, so we don't need to work that out. Um, this, well, b we can ignore because w23 doesn't occur in b. So it's just this multiplication, uh, which is the ith. So the ith uh, element of the result of this is just the ith row of w times x, their dot product. So it's a dot product. We can work that out as a sum, which is this sum. So it's the sum wij times xj, where we iterate over j. And i is given by the uh, sum we got from the chain rule. So this is a bunch of terms. And we know that the only term that is rele relevant for this derivative is the term where i is equal to 2 and j is equal to 3. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed a step. Uh, first, we can work this sum out of the derivative and out in front. So then we get one sum over the two indices i and j. And out of all those terms in this big sum, the only one that is non-zero is the one where i is equal to 2 and j is equal to 3. And in that term, the w's cancel out against each other, so we get x3. So we've reduced this complicated vector thing by applying the multivariate chain rule to this uh, l over k2 to x3. So for w23, this is the derivative. <laughs> 
the second element of the vector we get from the outer differentiation system multiplied by the third element from x, our input x. And remember, we remember our inputs when we do the computation graph. We remember all intermediate values. So that gives us this. If we fill this in in, in general terms, the derivative with respect to wij is the, k, the ith element of the vector times the jth element of x. And here we have to be a bit clever. We just have to figure out how do we now work out this matrix. So we're looking for a matrix, right? Because the gradient has the same shape as the thing we're taking the derivative over. So we're looking for something with the same shape as the matrix W, which has these values. At position ij, it has the value, uh, this value over here. Uh, so we have to be a bit clever, but it turns out you can compute that by taking this k over uh, this l over k vector that we get from the deep learning system and taking the outer product of x. And that gives us all these values for i and j arranged in a matrix in exactly the way we want. So the result after all of this is just uh, the derivative, the gradients of w are just this vector that we get, the gradient over the output times uh, with, uh, and the out, uh, multiplied by x, the outer product over x. Here's the other two, the other, uh, two gradients. Uh, we won't go through them, but if you want some practice, you can work these out as well. And that gives us matrix or tensor backpropagation. So the model is the application of functions to tensors. Each function defines both a forward and a backward function. The backward function, given the gradients over the outputs, computes the gradient over the inputs. And then once we have this, once every module has its forward and its backwards, then all the deep learning system has to do is start at the loss and call backwards and uh, in order on all these functions, trickling down the computation graph down to the leaves, and then all the gradients have been worked out as necessary. Um, one note I should mention this working out of the backward function, it's instructive to see how it works and why it works. You don't usually have to do it yourself. For almost anything you would want to do to a tensor, there is a function in PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever you choose to use. Uh, so you almost never have to do it yourself. Uh, but if you do, this is how to do it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's important to know that this is what happens uh, under the hood. Uh, some further reading if you didn't quite catch this. Uh, so that, that's all we aim to do. That's all we aim to add to backpropagation. Uh, then there's um, one more bit of syntactic sugar that most deep learning systems add, which is layers. So you can basically uh, bunch together your weights and your operations in uh, something called a module or a layer. So that something like this feed forward layer is put together in one object. But it's just a, a collection that puts together your weight, your bias, and the operations applied to them. And then you can very easily stack together two linear layers to give you your two-layer feedforward network. Right, so plenty of things to digest during the break. So let's take 15 minutes, and then I'll tell you what this picture is all about. All right, let's get started again. Find your seat, and uh, we'll continue. So we've seen how a deep learning system works. I can definitely understand if that's all a bit fuzzy and uh, it hasn't quite sunk in yet. But basically, the idea is we have a sort of new programming language where we can define operations, difficult operations on vectors. And so long as a single number comes out that we want to increase or de uh, that we want to decrease, we can train that computation. Um, but there's a sort of gap. So before the break, uh, no, sorry, uh, last week I told you that up until the 90s, all we did was two-layer neural networks, and if we tried to make them more layers, it didn't really work. Part of that was computation; it was very expensive. 
But part of that was also that we just didn't have the right bag of tricks to make backpropagation work for these deep computations of lots and lots of steps, lots and lo lots of layers. Uh, so let's go through the most important ingredients in that bag of tricks. And that's these uh, four guys. So we'll start with overcoming vanishing gradients. The problem with vanishing gradients is basically that once you've initialized your neural network, when you start training, uh, basically the most important layers when you start training are the bottom layers. They are the layers that first look at your input, at your data, to transform it. So those are the ones you want to update first. But their training signal has to come from the top of the network. right? So the thing you want to train first has to travel through all these randomly initialized layers above you. Uh, and that's sort of where it goes wrong. So if you imagine, for instance, here a, a very simple network with just one hidden unit, uh, four layers, uh, sorry, three hidden layers with one weight and no biases. Um, a couple of things can go wrong. For instance, let's say we uh, set these weights very high. What we get then, oh yeah, and we have sigmoid activations. So we set these weights very high. Uh, what you see is that the input value gets multiplied by one weight, then multiplied by another weight, then multiplied by another weight, and so on. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we look at what goes into the sigmoid, we get pushed more and more to the right of the sigmoid, where the gradient, the local gradient, the local derivative is very flat. So it's, the further we go to the right, the more the local derivative is like a flat line. Uh, so we don't want that, because that's basically a derivative that's almost zero. And if we get close enough to almost zero in a computer, it's basically zero. So if we get to around 10 to the power of minus 8, it might as well be zero. So we're, then we're not learning. Then once the gradient goes all the way down that network, we're not getting a learning signal here, and we never start training. We never start learning. So that's a problem. If we set it very, very small, negative, then we end up in this thing. We also have a negative gradient. Uh, so you might say, OK, then we should start close to 0. So we set all these weights close to 0, so that in the forward pass, uh, everything is over here. But then we don't get any output. So then the learning uh, signal is the same for, for all of our uh, uh, outputs. So the main problem is to set these weights to a good random initialization where we get a nice balanced gradient that isn't too big and that isn't too small at the start, and then we can start learning. Uh, and that's where the sigmoid becomes kind of a problem, because the maximum value for the sigmoid, for the gradient of the sigmoid, is over here, where it's uh, the steepest, which is 0 0.25. Which means that basically when we're going down the network, we're multiplying these 0.25s. So here we're at 1 16th, and here we are at, are at 1 64th. So even if we have all this uh, worked out properly, all these initializations, uh, if we have a deep enough network of sigmoids, then the gradient still uh, goes exponentially towards zero as we get to the bottom of the network. So step one is to ditch the sigmoid for hidden layers. For the output, it's sometimes very handy, because you want output sometimes to be between zero and one. But for the hidden layers, where it doesn't really matter how the uh, values are scaled. It turns out that the ReLU activation that we see here, the uh, rectified linear unit, which is, uh, we saw it in the last uh, lecture already. So it's uh, the identity function if the input is positive, otherwise it's uh, clipped to zero. It turns out that this is a very helpful nonlinear activation because, for different reasons, but primarily because the derivative is either one, so no matter how many one, ones of these cases you have in a row, the derivative uh, isn't amplified or, or shrunk, or it's zero. So here you have to be careful that for at least 
uh, one of your examples in your data set for every hidden neuron you're in this regime in the positive regime if you're in zero for all if you're in the zero regime if they're the outputs are negative for all neurons you get what is called a dead neuron that never learns because then the gradient is always zero so for those if that happens um, that part of your neural network and anything below it will never learn because the gradient is, uh, is zero but so long as your activations are normally distributed uh, standard normally distributed, so they have their mean at zero and uh, variance one on either side, then the ReLU is a very good, uh, good choice because the derivatives that you do see are always one and the neural network can sort of learn to turn certain neurons off, on and off by moving them into the negative part of the activation. So it turns out this ReLU works really well. Uh, but we do have to make sure that these units don't, that these activations, we still have to make sure that they don't blow up throughout the network or they don't shrink to zero. So we need to figure out an initialization of our weight matrices that ensures that, that if the input is normally distributed, standard normally distributed, then the output is also standard normally distributed. There are two standard ways of doing this. Um, Either you make W a random orthogonal matrix, eigenvalues all one. We haven't talked about eigenvalues yet, but um, basically you, there are functions to do this anyway. Uh, but a more simple way to do it is Glorow uniform initialization where you compute these two values. So uh, uh, square root of six over the number of inputs plus the number of outputs. Uh, and you take negative that value, positive that value, and in that range, you uniformly sample the elements of your weight matrix. And you initialize your entire weight matrix with uniform samples from this distribution. And it turns out if you do this, then uh, even for very deep networks, the activations uh, in every step have roughly the same distribution, so they don't decay very quickly and they don't blow up very quickly. And then with ReLU units, you get a very nice uh, gradient when you start training. And that's important. So if you do this, you can actually train deep neural networks uh, up to a point. And then if you want even to go even deeper, you need to do something called batch normalization, which we may look at in a later lecture. But this was basically the key to training deep neural networks. Uh, then we need to look at our gradient descent. So we've looked at gradient descent already, which is computing the loss over your whole data. Then we looked at stochastic gradient descent for neural networks, which is computing the loss over one instance in your data. Now we can look at mini-batch gradient descent, which is sort of somewhere in between. You take a small batch of elements in your data, and on that you compute the loss. So you compute the loss for everything individually, you sum it, and you do backpropagation on that. So you don't do backpropagation on one item of your data, but a small number of items from your data, which helps you balance the benefits and the uh, downsides of um, stochastic gradient descent and full batch gradient descent. So usually full batch gradient descent is way too memory expensive for a neural network setting. Um, but stochastic gradient descent has slightly too much noise. Uh, so you, yeah, if you work on batches, it works better. You get a little bit more parallelism, so you feed more data through your network in one go. So basically, usually what you do is uh, you're somewhere in this regime of between 16 and 128 instances, depending on your setting. And you basically pick your batch size uh, as big as it will go, as big as it will fit in your GPU memory, if you're training on GPUs and then tune the learning rate according to the batch size. That's one way of doing it. Although if you go too big, it might, decay, it might hurt learning performance a little bit. Sorry? Oh, good question. Are the instances selected randomly? Uh, not usually. Usually you just move through your data set in batches. But you can do. 
And one thing that is a good thing to do is, um, so if you move through your whole data set, that's called one epoch, it is good after each epoch to shuffle the data. So that after one loop through your data set, when you go through the next loop, you see the instances in a different order. Uh, it doesn't hurt not to do it, but it's usually, that's usually what we do. So that's mini batch gradient descent. Uh, then there's the question of optimizers. So we've seen basic, the basic gradient descent update rule already, which is you compute the gradient using this backpropagation thing, you multiply it by a small value called the learning rate, and you subtract it from your existing weight values, uh, which worked pretty well, but you can tweak that a little bit to, uh, to get some better performance. Uh, and that's called an optimizer. There are many optimizers, as you can see. Luckily, there are some pretty good default values. So Adam is basically, in most cases, a standard choice for an optimizer. Uh, there's also momentum and nestor of momentum. So I'll try to explain very quickly what, uh, how these work, um, starting with the, opt uh, with the momentum optimizer. Uh, so this is the plain gradient descent update rule. We subtract the gradient from the weights. With mo so uh, if you remember, the way I explained this was like a hiker in a snowstorm, sort of looking around, feeling around where the ground goes down the quickest. Uh, gradient descent with momentum is like a marble rolling down a hill. So in, it has uh, the force of gravity acts on it, and it's an acceleration that push it, it pushes it in a certain direction rather than a direct step. So what you see is that it has a momentum V, and V is added to the uh, weights every step. We don't change the weights directly, but we update V uh, using the gradients. So that means that if the, that there's a sort of lag uh, between how we change the gradients and what the effect is. And if we don't do much, we see that the, the gradient update continues in a certain way uh, based on what we've done before. So this helps it. You can think of this, if you think of a marble rolling down a, 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 a hill with lots of little rocks and lots of little local optima that we might get stuck in. If you have a heavy marble with lots of momentum, it can roll down that optimum, local optimum and then out again to the global optimum. That's sort of one way of thinking about momentum. There's a lot of theory behind this, but we won't go into that now. Uh, basically, you add one term. So you, have, you add one parameter. So we have mu n eta now. And uh, you add your gradients to the momentum and the momentum to the weights. Nestor of momentum is a very simple insight that if you know you're going to add these two things anyway, we know that we're going to add the momentum step and the gradient step. We might as well compute the gradients for the, uh, we might as well add the, do the momentum step first and then compute the gradients again and then uh, apply the gradient step. Uh, so if you switch these two around, you get what's called Nestor of momentum, which works a little better. Uh, and Nestor of momentum and Adam are sort of the basic, uh, the, the two basic things you might go for if you're choosing an optimizer. Uh, this is Adam. Adam is a little bit more complicated to explain, especially if you have to do it quickly. Basically, if you imagine a very complicated neural network where lots of weights are doing lots of different things, like for instance in the, neural, the feedforward neural networks that we saw, we have a weight matrix and a bias vector. And these bias vectors and the weight, these weight matrix are different parameters doing very different things. You can imagine that they require different learning rates. And this happens, this gets even worse if you chain lots of different types of neural networks together. So we'll see these convolutional neural networks. If you chain that with different types of neural networks together, all of them need to be optimized in different ways. Uh, so a single learning rate doesn't really cover that. And what people do, uh, 
or what people did sort of before Adam was to look at the trajectories of their gradients, look at how their gradients looked over a learning trajectory and how they differed from each other. So if you get huge gradients for one weight and very small gradients for another, you can um, set the learning rate for the huge gradients much lower and for the small gradients much bigger so that they all end up in the same regime, which is a little bit like normalizing your gradients. So basically what you want to do is you look at a normal training run, you find the mean and the variance of your gradients, and you subtract the mean and divide by the variance so that all your gradients become, uh, when applied by the, when uh, multiplied, when transformed in this way, become normally distributed. And then all the gradients are the same, sort of have the same distribution. And then you can set a uniform learning rate for all your gradients. Problem is you need to do a training run for that, set all your gradients, do another training run, your gradients change. Uh, so practically that's a sort of cycle that takes a lot of time. So what Adam does, it computes a exponential moving average, which is just a technique of computing a, uh, an average on the fly. You see a stream of numbers come in and you compute their average and you compute their uh, uh, variance uh, on the fly where the most recent examples you've seen count way more heavily than the earlier examples. It's kind of called an exponential moving average. This is a standard technique of computing an average on the fly. And Adam applies that to the gradients it's seen. So <clears throat> it gets a, uh, a mean for the gradients it's seen and an average, and it normalizes by those values, and then it subtracts the mean normalized by the variance from the actual weights. So this functions as a kind of momentum term, as we've seen before, but also as a kind of uh, moving average of your gradients so far. And this turns out to work really well for complex networks. So I fully appreciate if you don't quite understand it from this explanation, uh, but you don't really have to because it's fairly black box. You can just say in Keras or in um, PyTorch, I will use the Atom optimizer. Uh, there's a bunch of parameters, but the defaults are pretty good. In most cases, I've never had to tune them. So you just have to tune the learning rate and you can use Adam without fully understanding exactly how this works. Uh, but basically, if you have a large and complicated model, uh, plain stochastic gradient descent is not usually good enough. So you want either Adam or Nestorov momentum. So that's what we call optimizers. And then finally, there's regularizers. We've seen this a little bit already in the uh, context of support vector machines. Basically, the problem here is once we start building very, very large models with millions and sometimes billions of parameters, because that's where we're going to go, we end up with models that are so big that they can easily memorize the data without a problem. Uh, and quite often they don't, even though they can, they choose not to and they find a solution that generalizes. That's very interesting and mysterious. We might look at that in the last lecture. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they overfit. And then they become very good at overfitting because they have a lot of sort of memory capacity. So then we need to pull it back from overfitting. We need to stop the network from overfitting, from memorizing all the data. And that's what regularizers are for. Uh, so basically they pull the model back towards more simple models uh, in a soft way, so they don't, there's no hard cutoff. They're not saying you, you're not allowed to go for these complex solutions, but we're pulling you back towards the more simple solutions. Where what constitutes a simple solution, what constitutes a simple model, depends, is defined by your, regular, your regularizer. So look at the simplest, simplest option first, which is called L2 regularization. Basically, you take all of your parameters, you stick them in one big vector, so these could be a million parameters of your neural network. You stick them in one, one vector that we call theta here. You compute the norm of that vector, so how long is the arrow that that vector represents. And you add that to your loss with a small hyperparameter called lambda. So the bigger, uh, so here we see two solutions in model space. The bigger that vector is, the further you're, you go out in model space from 
the parameter from the model that has all zeros for parameters, the more you pay a penalty on top of your loss function. It's as straightforward as that. So basically what this regularizer is saying is simple models are ones that are closer to the origin in model space. And I prefer those. So if these two models here are equally good, then I prefer the uh, orange one to the brown one. Because, and we indicate that by giving it a lower penalty. So we can use this vector norm uh, to define a slightly different penalty. So the vector norm here is just the, um, you square the different elements and you take their uh, square root. That's how you compute the vector norm, uh, which is just Pythagoras basically applied to this picture here. So if you take this to the power of two and square root and turn the two into a different number, call that number P, you get a different vector norm, which is called a P norm. Uh, and we can plot that, what that looks like. Basically, these are all the vectors uh, which under the P norm have norm one. They make a circle, obviously, because all the vectors with the same length uh, make a circle. And if you set P to one, then all the vectors with the same length uh, make a diamond shape. Because basically we uh, raise these parameters to the power of one and we take the uh, first root, which is just basically removing any negatives. Or no, sorry, the raising to the power of one is removing any negatives, the first root disappears. So we're just summing up all the different elements. And if those sum to one, you're on this diamond. And the higher, uh, the, sorry, the lower you set P, the more you sort of squeeze in towards the origin. All of which means that if we add the L1 norm instead of the L2 norm, to our loss function as a penalty. We are looking at the same thing, but along these lines. So everything on the dotted line here has the same uh, level of simplicity according to this regularizer. So to give you some intuition, it's a bit like the L2 norm is a bit like if you have a marble and a nice round bowl like this, unregularized. You let the marble roll down the bowl and finds the center. Regularizing in a particular direction is like tilting the ball. So you tilt the ball a little bit and it rolls down and the point where the marble finds its lowest point is a bit to the left. And L1 regularization is like this, like using a ball where the, that has angled sides along the axis. So it has a sort of bias towards landing on the axis exactly. In other words, oh, sorry. It has a bias towards finding solutions that are exactly on these axes, because that's where it gets to go further away from the origin, which means it's likely to find uh, solutions that have some weight set exactly to zero. Here's what that looks like in, so these are the, this is the linear model from the second lecture. This is the unregularized version. This is what happens when we L2 regularize it, so it's pulled towards the origin. This is what happens when we L1 regularize it. So what you see is that the solutions on the axes are brighter. Uh, you can try this in TensorFlow. I'm a little bit behind, so I'll skip that slide. Uh, finally, there's dropout. This is a good regularization method where you basically take a neural network and randomly disable nodes during your training. Uh, and then during inference, you enable all nodes you have to multiply the weights by a little value in order to make sure that the activations are um, as expected as we've seen during training. And basically the intuition behind this is that if you learn to do something while you're drunk, then you can do it extra well when you're not drunk. So we sort of disable the neural network. We give it this penalty when it's uh, training. And then when it's not training, we disable the penalty. Uh, and that helps it, stops it from overfitting because a lot of it, so much of the neural network is sort of disabled uh, during training that it cannot use complicated 
specific ways of arranging its uh, weights to learn very specific solutions, because during the next training run, those white weights might suddenly be disabled. That's called dropout. So regularization L2, L1, and dropout. And that concludes our bag of tricks. So with that, basically started the deep learning revolution. There are lots of news articles, AlphaGo. Uh, well, you've all seen this sort of stuff in the news. Uh, a couple of examples. I'm afraid I'm going to have to rush through these. We'll see these examples in later lectures as well. Uh, but we still have to briefly discuss convolutional neural networks because most the most interesting neural networks don't actually use very many of these fully connected layers. The most interesting thing you can do with a neural network is to uh, take what you know about your problem domain, you, what you know about your data, and put it into the structure of the neural network. And the first uh, way of doing that that we'll look at is the convolutional neural network. And basically what a convolutional neural network does is it takes a uh, fully connected layer and it uses the fact that the data is arranged in a grid to its advantage to disable a lot of these connections and to tie a lot of these connections together. So what we do, we have pixel image and we add in the hidden layer one node for every little square patch of, in this case, two by two pixels in the input layer. And we slide that square patch down and we add another hidden node and so on until we've done that for all two by two patches in the image. And for every hidden node, we uh, use the same weights. So the four weights under every hidden nodes are always the same values. We still learn them. They can still be anything. So long as they're always the same for all of these hidden nodes. So this whole thing has just four weights. Then we can do the same thing again and get another patch of four by four pixels, which just adds two more weights to the uh, to this layer. It's basically a convolutional neural network. Uh, so it's a little bit, bit clearer if we look at it from the side. So we do a one D convolution. Basically, here we know that the nodes are arranged in a row. They have a kind of spatial dimension in a row. So every group of three input nodes is connected to one output node, to one hidden layer node, and the weights are shared. So the leftmost connection is always blue in this case, so that means that th that weight, whatever it is, whatever we end up learning, is always the same for all those uh, connections. And here we've wired together three input nodes to one hidden layer, we call that the kernel size. Now one problem here is that the output size is slightly different from the input size, and that the nodes on the side don't contribute as much. You see here the node all the way on the right contributes only to one output node, whereas, whereas nodes in the middle contribute to three hidden nodes. Uh, so what we usually do is add a little padding, as it's called, which is just some zero nodes on either end, which ensures, in this case, that the number of output nodes is the same as the number of inputs node, input nodes before, the, before we added the padding and that the nodes on the side can contribute a little bit more to the, uh, to the output. And then if we want additional, uh, if we have additional input channels or output channels, for instance, if the input is an image, we have three color, is, is a color image, and we have three color channels in the input, we just add new weights for the inputs, uh, input channels. So here we have a, a, an input sequence with two channels. Uh, and we repeat the weights again over the, over the sequence, but the weights are different between the first and the second channel. Uh, so that's how a convolution, convolutional neural network is wired up. So basically we just start with an image and end up with an image or with a sequence. Uh, here's just a, an overview of how that looks in an image. We have a three by three kernel. We move it over one step every time so we say we have a stride of one. You can also have a higher stride, but usually you do a stride of one. And then you pad enough so that the input, the number of input nodes is the same as the number of output nodes. And the nice thing is that the output here is also arranged in a grid. So the output is also a grid of pixels, 
or things you can think of as pixels. But whereas the input had very clearly defined channels with the meaning of being red, blue, and green, the output has usually more channels with some learned meaning that we don't know. And between this input kernel and the uh, output pixel that it uh, points to, you can think of as all of these input nodes here being fully connected to all these output nodes here. So that's a convolution over an image. It goes from one three tensor to another, another three tensor. And now you can stack these things, right? Because this is three tensor, so you can stack another convolution on top of that and another on top of that. Um, but at some point, the output is going to get very big. So we have high, uh, if it's a high resolution image, multiplying that by a lot, a lot of channels, that gets very big. And we want to go to more and more channels. So we'd like to reduce the resolution. And the most common way of doing that is a max pooling layer, which basically does this kernel thing again, uh, except with stride two in this case. So we have a two, uh, two by two max pool. So we chunk the image into two by two pix uh, patches of two by two pixels, and we replace each patch of two by two pixels with its maximum value. So for this two by two patch, we replace it by the value four. And that halves our resolution along each spatial dimension. So then we have room in memory for more channels. So the basic idea of putting together a convolutional neural network by chaining a bunch of these convolutions together with max pools when the number of channels gets too big. So as the number of channels gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you reduce the spatial resolution until by the end you basically end up with a one by one representation of your image with lots of channels, which is just a hidden vector. So you have one hidden vector representing whatever's in your image. You map that to your class uh, vectors, and then you can train that. Here we see a much deeper network than the, uh, the two-layer feed-forward network that we saw. Uh, and in worksheet four, the Keras worksheet, you can see how this works, how you fit together a uh, convolutional neural network in Keras. So you see here that you basically stack a bunch of these layers together. Uh, there's a little dropout even there, some max pool layer, convolution layer, and we pick from the optimizers the atom optimizer. We pick a loss, categorical cross-entropy, which we already know, and then we train. That's basically how this works. That's deep learning in Keras. Uh, there's some explanation of what these filters mean, these intermediate values that the convolutional neural network learns. I'll skip past that, but have a look at the slides if you're interested. But I'd like to finish on the question of what deep learning really is and what, it, what makes it so different from the traditional machine learning that we've already seen. Um, so for instance, let's look at an example of um, <clears throat> uh, entity recognition or knowledge extraction from old newspapers. If you do that in the traditional way, the pre-deep learning way, <clears throat> you would pass every newspaper through optical character recognition, recognize the characters, tokenize it into words, recognize which words refer to named entities, figure out what the relations are that are expressed between those entities, and then hopefully you can ask, once you've transformed it all into structured knowledge, you can ask, answer questions like, when did Obama become president? That's the sort of traditional view of things. So uh, an intelligent system is a chain of these things that you want to do in order to answer a question. And the problem in traditional machine learning is that you can do all of these things by machine learning or by things that look a lot like machine learning. And you can do all of them with relatively little error. So let's say you do all of them with 1% error and you think, hey, that's great. The whole pipeline will not have 1% error because errors propagate. So if what you feed into your tokenization is almost correct, then your tokenization is going to do a little bit worse and that multi uh, multiply its error, which is gonna make your named entity recognition that much worse and so on and so on and so on. So if you chain all these things together that 
all almost work in the machine learning way, the whole thing is going to not work at all. And in order to fix that, one way to fix that is to train the whole thing end to end. So you can pre-train these things a little bit if you need to, but basically you make this whole thing one machine learning model, which we can do with deep learning. You ensure that an error signal can propagate back down the pipeline. And then you can deal with this error propagation. Uh, but for that, you need deep learning. You need learning in multiple steps, in multiple layers, and one learning system that can learn over the whole thing. So that's where traditional machine learning differs from uh, deep learning. Traditional machine learning had this kind of raw data view, where you take your raw data, you manually extract a bunch of features, throw away a lot of information, and then do your learning. And deep learning is a lot more like starting with your raw data, like images, starting with raw data like language, representing your raw data with all the information present as a tensor, and step by step learning how to extract features from your raw data to produce your output, so that everything from your raw data to your output is learned and you don't throw away information. And finally, when you play with deep learning, when you build something with deep learning, it feels a lot more like playing with Legos as opposed to playing with Playmobil, whereas Playmobil, if you buy a bus as nice as this, uh, if you buy a school bus, you get a school bus and you can't really turn it into anything else. Whereas with Lego, you get access to the building blocks. And even though you can build classifiers and regression models and clustering with Lego, you can also turn your school bus into a spaceship if you want to. So we'll see that in the next couple of lectures, exactly how uh, uh, this works in deep learning. Uh, and that's all I had for you today. So I'll see you next Thursday when we'll talk more about probability. <laughs>